Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoyed the podcast. Have a great day. So my name's Tim, I'm an alcoholic. Um, uh, I don't speak for AA. Uh, you need to know that. This is going to be an, a very personal view um and i may change my mind at a later point in time so uh this is just how things appear to me today i've gone back on almost everything i've i've thought at some point um so i'll probably go back on this but this is how things appear to me um someone could keep an eye on the other microphones that would be super helpful thanks alistair um, so this is called the games we play with sponsors. Uh, now, what I'm going to be talking about this evening is is very it's such a sensitive topic, frankly. Um, it's not talked about in meetings at all um, uh, because it's so sensitive. Although if you've got a sponsor and you have sponsees of your own, as soon as you get sponsees of your own, you discover yourself talking to your sponsor far more than you did when you had your own problems. Um, and so all of this material, it's not, I haven't come up with anything new. I, all of this has been going on behind the scenes in Alcoholics Anonymous since its founding people work out how on earth are we going to deal with this now I was a very difficult character when I got to AA and so all this everything I'm going to describe in terms of what sponsees can do is stuff I have done myself but the question is if you're a sponsor when you're presented with it how do you deal with it and also um, with these so-called games I'll come to what we mean by game in a little bit uh, with these games, the sponsor is as much of a player as the sponsee. And I'll come to that as well, what the sponsor's role in these. So my view of sponsorship is, is my job is to make myself a channel for the higher power to work through me to help other people. I don't help people. A higher power helps people. I offer myself up to the process. The higher power uses uh, our knowledge and experience. Now, for the relationship to work well, the sponsor and the sponsee need to be on the same page about what the purpose, is, purpose of the relationship is. And sponsees won't automatically know this because a sponsorship is unlike any other relationship that I know of. It's, it's, it has similarities with all sorts of things, but it is none of those things. It's not like therapy. It's not like friendship. It's not like anything else. So... It's very important with a, a, a sponsee who is particularly well with people who are new to the notion of sponsorship to set out exactly what you're there for. And of course, people are free to have whatever sorts of relationships with sponsors or sponsees that they want. This is just what I just what I do based on what I found to have worked. And I'll come to why the things that don't work don't work in a bit, which is how I got to this point. So I'm there to take the person through the steps. I'm there to provide guidance on the program and on the fellowship more generally. Uh, I think we are there to help people troubleshoot um, uh, emotional difficulties and practical difficulties by, by using those as case studies for how to apply the program. And also, it, it's apps, I think it's absolutely the case. Uh, some people say they don't give advice um, if I hadn't been given advice when I was new, I would have been dead because I would have been following my own advice. If I hadn't been following the advice of other people in AA, I would have been following my own catastrophic best thinking. But there are limits to what the advice uh, is. And um, uh, most of the best advice actually just boils down to basic common sense life tips and experience. And that's the, a very good way to provide advice is simply say, well, this is what I did. This is my experience. What I'm not for as a sponsor is doing things for sponsees that they can and should do for themselves. So looking at meeting details, finding things on a particular page in the big book, providing information that can be Googled. Um, I'm not there to provide medical advice, psychiatric advice or psychotherapeutic advice. 
I'm, I, I'm not there to, some people say I need a sponsor so I can be accountable. I'm not there to be someone's accountability buddy or something. I, I've never really under, understood that. I, I think according to the big book anyway, I'm not accountable to other people. I'm accountable to my higher power um, and to myself. And no one else can take that, that from me. Uh, or uh, I'm, I'm not there to plug someone else's motivation gap. If they're unwilling, I'm not there to supply the willingness for them. Uh, and I'm not there to listen to venting. Um, or as Anne Wilson Schaefe, S-C-H-A-E-F, calls it, emotional vomiting. <laughs> um, I, with friends, we allow, a good friend and I allow ourselves about 30 seconds to 75 seconds, and then we're done. My other half permits me maybe five or six seconds of venting and then says that needs to stop. Uh, I'm not there as a sponsor to hear 10 minute, 15 minute, 20 minute venting sessions. And I don't, I don't do that to my sponsor. Um, friendship and sponsorship. There's a line in the big book where it says we offer them friendship and fellowship. But I think that's uh, meant in very general terms. It doesn't, I remember I had a sponsor called Brian. He's still sober. Very, very good. Uh, uh, very wise is Brian. He's been sober a thousand years. And um, I said to him once, can we meet for a coffee? And he, it was over the phone, but I could feel him leaning in. And he said, you know, we're not friends, don't you? Um, and I, a little shiver ran down my back. Because I'd never really, I'd never really thought that one through. But I, I was trying to treat him as a friend when he was my sponsor. So we aim to be friendly and cordial and as personable as our individual personalities allow. I'm on a fairly short leash with that one, I'm afraid. So uh, some people are much friendlier than me. So go and talk to them. Um, uh, so I try to be friendly, but it's it's I've had lots of sponsors over the years and all of them have had the single principle that business is business. And they've, they've expressed it in different ways. They've all been very different personalities, but that is the core principle that's come down to me from every single sponsor. We're there to do a specific job and other roles get in the way of that. Uh, occasionally, I've made the mistake of letting friendship develop out of uh, the sponsorship. Um, and in every single case, it's the friendship's got in the way of the sponsorship because it's very hard to challenge someone when they're your friend as well as your sponsee. There are very occasional exceptions, uh, but vanishingly rare. Um, it's almost impossible to challenge someone and the person will also not be willing to be challenged by someone they consider to be a friend. You can be challenged by someone that you're not about to go out for dinner with. But if you're going out for dinner with them or going on holiday with them, you don't want to be challenged by them. Um, there are ways of making it work, but that's that's for another. I think that's for another session that, that that's for those except there are exceptional circumstances. So these are general principles. They do admit exceptions. Uh, and also one thing that I've noticed again and again, and again, not just with me, but with friends of mine as well, who've made friends with their sponsees. When the friendship is mixed in with the sponsorship, you usually lose both. And so it's best to pick. Pick one, pick which one is more important. Sometimes the friendship is more important and you just go and get someone else as your sponsor. Uh, most people, most of the time, I find once you explain what I've just said, are totally fine, can understand it and follow it. And the relationship functions well. But there are sometimes some other patterns which come into play and let's call these games. Now, the notion of games, uh, there's a... a, a writer in the domain of psychology called Eric Byrne, B-E-R-N-E. And I borrowed his term. I'm not an expert in his stuff by any means. I'm not a trained psychologist. I don't pretend to be. I think there is one in the house, but I won't out the person. Um, uh, but I found his writings very, very useful. So what he talks about is how what is going on in the, on the surface of the conversation is not what is going on underneath and that there are hidden purposes to conversations 
or exchanges or interactions. Uh, and that that's what the real purpose is. What is going on on the surface is merely operating as a vehicle for what is going on underneath. Now, as I say, I'm not, not going to present a sort of strict Bernian analysis. Of this. I borrowed the idea, I borrowed the term, and I've run with it because it helps me explain what I've experienced but couldn't put words to until I read his stuff. And what reading his stuff also helped was for me to learn how to spot and stop the games happening, but maintain the sponsorship relationship so that the benefit can be uh, accrued from it by the by the sponsee. Uh, now, he calls it a game. Uh, now, it's not fun. It, 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 they're not called games because they're enjoyable. So it's not like Monopoly or Twister or... or Kachang. Um, they're not fun, but what they are, they're, they're called games because they're predictable sequences of moves and counter moves, like in drafts or chess or whatever. And there is a payoff, and the payoff is the real reason for the interaction. Uh, and the kinds of payoffs, when I've played these games with people, and by the way, sometimes people talk about people, oh, so you know. Uh, Susan or Clive or George or Harry is playing a game with me. Often what they mean by that is some deliberate deception. I'm not talking about deliberate deception here. Occasionally, there are jerks who are deliberately trying to rile you or, or deceive you or whatever. But my experience is that it's incredibly rare in, in, in AA. There are very few people I look back and think there was a, that was a conscious plan. I, in, I think in, in 99 cases out of 100, in 99 people out of 100, these patterns, they're like, they're like um, software programs which just start running automatically. People are not aware of what is going on and they're not absolutely not to blame, but we, we do need to, to uh, identify what is going on and stop it because it doesn't doesn't help uh so this is not a sort of blamey thing that we're doing here it's learning what works and what doesn't work now with the with these games these subconscious games as i say i i, I all the ones i'm going to talk about i have played myself as the sponsee and um a sponsorship necessarily is is a little bit like a relationship with an authority figure now we're not authorities in terms of being further up but we are in terms of being further along so there isn't we're not vertically above people we're horizontally further ahead because we've been sober for longer or we've got more experience or that so we're equals we're brothers but one of us has been around one of us has got some some useful things to share um, but these games I learned to play them with authority figures when I was a kid and then I got a sponsor and boom here was a new venue to play out all of my stuff with authority figures now I said there are these ri these these uh, standard moves and counter moves um, and there's a payoff and the payoffs that I sought in my interactions with old timers, with sponsors, with basically anyone further ahead than me in AA. And as I say, I, I, I've done this with authority figures, with bosses, with parents, with all sorts of people. Um, the payoffs usually involve one of the following attention. I just want someone to look at me, to see me, to valid, whatever. Uh, validation and praise i want to be patted on the head i want i want special treatment i want to be thought of as someone who is special in some way uh, absolution i want i feel guilty and i want you to let me off the hook i want to find a way of avoiding making progress and doing any actual work whilst getting the points for making it look as though i'm progressing so there's often what i would want to do is I, I want to get rid of the guilt for not working the program. So I would engage in these maneuvers of basically treading water. So it looks as though I'm doing something, but actually no progress is being made. So avoiding making progress. Um, Paul M talks about 
uh, activity versus action. So activity is like being in a rocking chair and you're going back and forth, but you're not actually getting anywhere. Uh, shifting responsibility to someone else. If you tell me what to do, if it goes wrong, it's your fault, not mine. Shifting blame to someone else. So, and this is the standard thing I learned in Al-Anon. When an alcoholic is angry and blaming, it's because they feel guilty and they want to make you guilty so that you're like, so it's like past, it's like exploding past the parcel. So they want to make sure that when the music stops, you're holding the parcel so it blows up in your face, not theirs. And I, as I say, I've played this game myself. If I can make so, if I can make make something someone else's fault, I no longer need to feel guilty. And also, a particularly pernicious one is defeating an authority figure. So it's like du I would duel old timers in AA. I would draw them on thick on tricky subjects, have these sort of quasi arguments, and feel very self satisfied with myself that I had won. And uh, occasionally I've been set up for these and I've certainly set other people up for these. Um, so I'm not proud of any of those. But the thing is, I learned these. I, I don't know where I learned them from. I guess I must have observed people around me and I just sort of picked them up as innate ways of being. And then I played them out in AA. Um, as I said, these, these are un, unconscious until you learn how to become conscious of them. And then what, what's interesting when you when you can call out one of these games, the game is over because it kind of needs to be under the cover of darkness to operate. As soon as it's brought to the surface, you, you can't play it anymore. Um, what I'm going to talk about is some specific some specific examples. I mean that there are endless examples because there are endless types of people in the world, but these are the main ones that seem to crop up in sponsorship a lot. And when talking about these, as I say, I want to repeat that one must, when one, when you spot someone playing these or you catch yourself engaging as the sponsor in one of these games subconsciously or unconsciously, uh, that both people are innocent. That what happens, it's like, it's like the program starts up in me. When people talk about being triggered, I think that's absolutely the right sense. It's like someone flips the switch and you're playing and it's like you're watching yourself engaging in an interaction you know is super unhealthy, but for some reason you can't find the stop button. So one's got to view people as innocent in this. As soon as you get angry with them, you've kind of... that's part of the game actually is when you become angry that can be one of the moves that's being elicited so to remain ne completely neutral when observing these and to view everyone as innocent and also I've given these like funny names or well, at least I think they're funny um to make fun out of this I get this from Jim with it was Joe, my sponsor, Joe's first sponsor in San Antonio, got sober in 1957, still sober, still sharing. They can't stop him. Um, he's very good, but he gives his character defects nicknames, little playful names, so we don't take ourselves too seriously. So here goes, but I'm going to try and give brief descriptions of the game, how I as the sponsor unconsciously participate in the game and then the antidote how to stop the game the first one i would call i'm only little this is where i go to a sponsor claiming i just don't know what to do about fear i know i've been in aa for 17 years but this fear is different i just don't know can you help me i will and the sponsor this is where, as a sponsor, if I've got if I've got untreated Alanonism, I will rush in and rescue. the The antidote is if you if if you uh, you can always tell with a sponsee that a game is being played, and not just a sponsee. Sometimes it's newcomers, it's acquaintances, it people in AA play these the whole time at group conscience meetings. <laughs> business meetings, intergroup meetings, region meetings. I won't even go near the board. Um, when you, um, what was I going to say? Um, I'm going to get, there's another point, but I'll come, when I remember it, I'll come back to it. Um, when I spot someone in this particular one, the job is to, oh, that's what I was going to say is, you know that a game is being played 
when you're having a perfectly normal conversation with someone and then they say something and your whole body tenses up. I don't know if you ever, I mean, maybe, maybe it's just me. Claire's nodding. <laughs> Ellie Shever's smiling. So I'm guessing I'm not the only one. Um, my body tenses. In a very serious case, my blood starts to run backwards. Just this cold chill because it's reminding me of something. And if that's the point, if I'm not careful, that's when I get sucked in. So uh, that's how you spot it. Your body will never lie. If it's if you have those visceral reactions, there's something going on below the surface of the interaction. And you need to watch out because the body, as I say, the body never lies. The emotions are all over the place and the mind doesn't know how to tell the truth. But the body has no ability to dissimulate it. It always tells the truth. It, it, you can rely on that. Um, so with this one, it's very simple. Uh, there, there, there's a, there's, a, there's a, a variant of it called Home James, where you feel that you're becoming the sponsee's manservant or maid. <laughs> um, so in these cases, it's very simple, very gently, just point out that the person already has the solution, that they're able to find the information themselves, that whatever they're looking for is already to hand. Uh, it doesn't need to be explained. It doesn't need to be repeated. I mean, by the way, we're all of us on a journey with this as sponsees and as sponsors. So what I'm setting out is ideals. I know I fall short of these. I still fall for the game. I still take the bait on occasion. Uh, I don't think one ever gets this perfectly. So what I'm setting out here is the ideals when I'm talking about the antidotes. The next game is look at what the cat brought in. So you know the way cats bring in dead mice and they or not, they're not. No, that's that's the point. If the mouse were dead, it would be fine. But the mouse is half dead and the cat drops the half dead mouse on the mat and then it runs around half dead. And your job now it's your problem. It's your problem to deal with the half dead mouse. And this is where when I, as a sponsee, am presented with a situation I find difficult, and rather than applying any kind of knowledge or experience or expertise or anything that I've learned in AA over the God knows how many years, I immediately phone my sponsor in a panicky, breathy voice, breathy voice, drop the situation in garbled fashion in front of them and say, you sort it out. It's up to you. You're my sponsor. They say to call your sponsor when you're upset. So I'm upset and I'm calling. you. Now, when you're super new, you know, if you're in your first few minutes of recovery or days or week, like I've got, you, you have no resources. But by the time you have the resources, the sponsor's job is to take the sponsee from the furthest point they can reach themselves and help them go further. It's a waste of time for the sponsor to do what the sponsee can do for themselves and, 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 and do the kind of basic processing. Now, sometimes when you're really upset as a sponsee, there's a limit to how much basic processing you can do. But it's just a courtesy. Get the facts straight. Who are the people involved? Um, dramatis personae first. Blow by blow. What happened in the order that the things happened? And then say what you do know about the solution and why you still have a problem so there are what so so rather than just you know sending the sponsee away you show them how to pre-process a situation so that when they bring the situation to you you can add value to it rather than doing their job for them amnesia is the next game have you ever had the situation in recovery where you talk to someone for 45 minutes about a situation or two hours and you feel so pleased at the end of it that you've really you've gotten to the bottom of it you've made the most amazing progress you really feel that the person understood all sorts of fundamental ideas and then two weeks later they phone up with an almost identical situation with absolutely no memory of what you discussed the last time you spoke and there's a Clancy story about when he did a 12-step call, uh, or, or, or rather someone called 
him and said, I, I've let you down, I've let AA down, I've drunk again, will you help me? And he goes over and he talks to this drunk all night, gets back to his house in the morning, about to have a shower, goes straight into work without any sleep or barely any sleep. And the drunk calls him and says, I thought you said you were going to come over. Like, he's so drunk, he has no recollection of what happened. Now, sometimes that you know, it, one doesn't necessarily diagnose these correctly every time, but if that keeps happening, then there's a purpose to those conversations when you're in inverted commas processing situations with people and it's not for them to learn how to process them it's the pro the processing itself is the payoff the content you're trying to give them the program they don't want the program they want the processing and i i'm not going to go into the psychological re psychological reasons why because that's that's a different conversation it's out of the scope of this the job as the sponsor is I think to spot when this is happening and what I get people to do is to take notes from the conversations we have and to have a notebook uh, with AA solutions and whenever to scan the conversations we've had to scan the notes and put all of their solutions that anyone in AA tells them about from the from tapes from AA books, from meetings, from sponsors, from friends, to keep all the solutions together so that they're building up a barrage of solutions rather than having to come to you every single time something happens because they've developed amnesia. And these are not people who've got amnesia. There is something else going on. Now, there are people with mental illness. There are people who are very, very severely damaged psychologically and maybe with brain damage whatever i'm not talking about that i'm talking about people who may be in their everyday lives a super co super competent and never forget anything and uh, you know and their jobs will 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 be absolute stars but when it comes to this stuff a whole other dynamic comes into play the next game is called greased pig they say that wrestling a greased pig is pointless because you end up covered in mud and the greased pig loves it. Now, what this looks like as a sponsee, um, you see, I will have a problem and I will ask for input and guidance. And then as soon as the guidance starts being given, I react to it, I resist it, I reject it, and then I reproach the sponsor for providing it and go around meetings warning people off my sponsor because he's giving such damaging advice. That's the piece de resistance. Once, once, you've, once you've, you've, you've sworn at your sponsor and put the phone down, I've done this, you, you go around besmirching their reputation. Um, but here's the interesting thing. I was the one that asked for the input. And uh, what I was taught uh, very early in AA by some really good sponsors who were very helpful to, to me uh, was that if, if I, as soon as I started to argue, they said, um, why don't you call back another time when you've got a more constructive attitude. Now, I've got, to my shame, I've got this very wrong over the years, and I respond to someone resisting anything I'm saying with con con convincing, persuading, cajoling, and arguing. Now, this is difficult because often the, the questions are legitimate and there's a really interesting and useful discussion that needs to be had. So there's some subtlety here. This is not black and white. Sometimes it can take a while to work out whether this is someone asking genuine questions because they genuinely want to understand this and when someone is resisting. It, it, you can't always tell 100%, but you can feel it physically, usually. So it's not to do with the words that you're saying, it's to do with the dynamic that's going on in the situation. So when I feel that I'm pushing up against something, when I'm explaining things, that's when I've learned to stop and reconvene later or move to a different topic, but not to engage in trying to force through the wall of resistance because it doesn't work. The next game is called, someone gave me this, this term for it, pigeon chess. 
When you play chess with a pigeon, it disregards the rules of chess. It struts all around the board, knocking over pieces, and then acts like it won. Um, now, the way this works as a sponsee, I'll ask someone for help. And it's all so innocent. Yeah, I'm in such a situation. You've helped me so much in the past. And I'd really love your input on this. And then they start to provide the input. And then I shift into a different gear. And I, I switch focus. I, I misconstrue what people are saying. There was a sketch many years ago I've not been able to find where every single thing the diner says, the waiter misconstrues. So the diner says, does the chicken come with vegetables? And the waiter says, it doesn't come, we bring it. And I would do this with spawns, like whatever they would say, I would find a way of interpreting it and responding it as though I'd misunderstood what they'd said. Um, shifting the facts, so just very gradually changing the constellation of facts during the course of the conversation so that um, the person I'm trying to get advice from is basically operating in the dark, rambling, going around in circles, reopening set settled points and just generally resisting. And to my shame, when I've done this with sponsors or other people, I secretly enjoy it. I don't know why, but I do. Um, I, I love being the pigeon. Um, the job as the sponsor, I think, is to spot when no progress is being made and say, honey, how about you go to a couple of meetings, sleep on it, pray, read your little big book, listen to some of these, listen to some of those, have some dinner, and we'll talk tomorrow. And then very often just simply pausing and reconvening. If they do call back, it's with a different attitude. And if you tried to battle with it, you would have got nowhere. If you pause and reconvene, often the next day, it's fine. Um, there are another, the, the next two are slightly peculiar ones. They're not, um, they don't look like resistance, but they are. The first one is called heavy weather from the phrase to make heavy weather of something. This is where you give someone a very simple task and they turn it into the, 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 the labors of Hercules. And, you know, you're expecting someone to do a little bullet point list, uh, which will take 10 minutes and it can be fitted on one, not even A4, A5 piece of paper, but they go and buy uh, a full scat notebook but, uh, uh, and then two weeks later you're like how are you getting on with it oh it's so hard this step work is so hard it, there's so much to do I don't think I, I'm gonna finish it's just there's too much bother. um I've done this as a sponsee and it's a way of uh, avoiding progress by making it look as though you're working very, very hard. And then th the brilliant thing about it is you make it the sponsor's fault for how tired and difficult you're finding it. But the fact is you've, uh, you've changed the nature and the scope of the task to make it impossible so that you can't complete it, but it's someone else's fault that you can't complete it. So it's that thing of you, you, you want to get rid of the guilt and make it someone else's fault. So that's heavy weather. There's a variation of this called vanilla flavoring. So vanilla flavoring, if you can't find vanilla essence in the little local shop, you get vanilla flavoring instead. It ain't the same. Everyone will know. And this is where you give someone a task and they change the task. They come back with a completely different task and are very disappointed when you say that it wasn't what they asked. And it's it's a variation of the same thing. Uh, what I tend to do is, if there's a suspicion of this, I give people very small tasks, like tiny little bits, and see if they can do that and gradually build up. And that usually works. Now, this game, this the game of heavy weather or vanilla flavoring, it happens a lot in step four where people try to turn the exercise into something else. They're not, and, and sometimes it's not necessarily for obstruction, it's for other purposes as well. So, but gradually getting people used to the idea of doing the exercise as it's presented rather, rather than using it for some other purposes. And that is just a matter of very gently training people by giving them very small bite-sized pieces. 
<laughs> the next one, the dog ate my homework. Now you all know what this one is. It, it's finding a thousand and one excuses for why whatever it, whatever you're supposed to be doing hasn't been done. Um, and uh, if you're smart, you'll pres you'll find excuses which are t apparently totally beyond your control. But it's amazing when someone shifts from being unwilling to willing, how lots of things which appear to be outside their control suddenly come within their control. Um, the mistake that I can make as a sponsor here is to engage in discussion of the excuses or reasons. And honestly, uh, I've started, I've reverted to what was shown to me a very long time ago. And I resisted doing as a sponsor, which is saying, if you're willing, you'll find a way click, which is exactly what people did with me. If you're willing, you'll find a way. Um, in A Course in Miracles, it talks about um, hiding unwillingness behind a veil of circumstances that appear to be outside one's control. So other people have spotted it too. We have, you know, we haven't invented this. This is a well-established phenomenon. Um, jobs worth is the next one uh, from the phrase something that's more than my jobs worth. So it's when someone will do the, uh, it was very common within the, in the sort of labour disputes of the 1970s in this country where people would refuse to do anything beyond what they were contractually obliged to do and um it's very difficult to sponsor someone when you feel like you're like 87 times more enthusiastic about their recovery than they are and um, honestly um i think my, my for this to work my heart has to be in it it doesn't, it just doesn't work when I'm mechanically going through the motions. So, and I think it can sour people's experience of the steps if they kind of force their way through it when they don't want, they basically don't want to do it. Uh, because first of all, it never gets done properly. And if it's not done properly, it doesn't go all the way in. It's kind of bouncy, it bounces off. Um, so I, and then there's a variation that's called sufferance where people will comply but they'll be face pulling and sighing just to tell you how horrible the task you've just given them is. And I've started to pick people up on the sighing because it's it's kind of an odd, I don't know how aware people are of doing it, but it's really disconcerting as a sponsor when you're really, you're giving your free time to do this and you're just getting sighs and face pulling and eye rolling. <laughs> eye rolling is my favorite one um some people can do all three they ought to be in the circus it's amazing um and, and you know i've done i've done it myself um um pauses as well very 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 after you suggest something a very very long pause long dramatic pauses um i've started uh, with someone a few months ago i started asking Tell me, can you ask yourself why you let yourself sigh audibly at that point? And the funny thing was the person like immediately recognized it, admitted it. We had a good conversation about it and it never happened again. Uh, so often addressing these head on in a kind of jokey, fun way, say, honey, did you see what you just did there? And people, if you do it in the right way, you can you can bring up almost anything. But the point is to, uh, you know, you've got to be neutral when you bring it up. If you're angry when you bring it up, the anger will telegraph. None of us are perfect. We're all working towards that. But that's the ideal. Uh, uh, two or three more, then we'll go on to some some more solutions. Uh, and I'm going to start. I'm going to speed up slightly. Papal dispensation. So this is where I've got a, a decision that I've made, which I know is selfish. And I want my sponsor to tell me that it's somehow in accordance with the principles of the AA or the Al-Anon program so that I can do it and not feel guilty about it. Uh, 19 out of 20 questions of shall I do X or shall I do Y to someone else in AA, it's because I want someone to give me the dispensation to do the thing that I want to do, but I kind of know is naughty. Papal absolution is when you've already done it and you want them afterwards to tell you that it's okay. 
or and it happens a lot with people who slip or people who act out with sex or food or whatever is they want to be told it's okay and with my I, a friend a few years ago who said you need to keep talking about this stuff with me but me telling me that you've done it does not make it okay you need to stop doing it at some point but don't stop talking but i can't give you absolution um here it's my job as a sponsor to push the responsibility for decision making back onto the individual and say i'm not here to make your decisions for you or to co-sign them i just can't do that um a couple more little little games that get played checkmate um a, a good example of checkmate if you've ever played chess when you're in a situation you realize if you move the queen forward uh the game's over if you if keep the queen where it is the game is over like whatever you do you're going to be you're going to be checkmated your king is vulnerable whatever however you move your king is vulnerable um one of the great tools if someone is super resistant or aggressive um with you as a sponsor to say sweetheart this isn't working so maybe find someone you feel more comfortable with you seem really tense when you talk to me so how about you find someone you feel more comfortable with i think maybe you'll make more progress because you'll be able to accept what they're offering fine uh now there was a there have been situations where i asked suggested people do things and they they think you're a terrible tyrant for suggesting lots of things and overburdening with them th with these unreasonable demands and so you say that's that's fine that's fine you i don't have to sponsor you if you don't want to do it this way that's absolutely fine there are lots of different ways of doing recovery of doing aa of doing the big book blah 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 so how about you go with someone else so you get out of being the villain by saying we don't have to do this it's fine if you don't want to do this um i've had this on many occasions someone says you're abandoning me so if you stay as the sponsor offering suggestions you're bullying them by loading them with tasks and if you threaten to withdraw the sponsorship you're abandoning them if you move forward you're the villain if you move back you're the villain and in those situations you can't win reason won't work just i've just learned to to bow out gracefully in those situations and it, this is not a blamey thing when something isn't working don't try and force it with maybe a slight shift that the person goes to someone else makes huge progress if they'd stuck with you they would have been stuck for years so there's no, there's nothing wrong with this i had a whole load of sponsors in my first year and it was a uh, first couple of years and it was a good thing i needed each one each one got me to the next stage and then the next stage sometimes it lasts six weeks sometimes it lasts 10 years so it's not a sign of failure on either part um due diligence sometimes you get very very closely questioned by a sponsor sponsee on uh what you're suggesting now some explanation is required and it's completely legitimate to ask some questions but sometimes you feel as though you're being cross-examined like again your body will tell you when this is going on uh sometimes it's a way of of, of discounting the advice by basically throwing lots of skepticism at it um the advice i was given actually by course in miracles teacher about how to approach the course in miracles is uh don't analyze the suggestions try out try them out and then you'll see if they work or not if they don't work fine go and do something else and that's what i say to sponsors who get super questiony before they'll do something is just just try it just try it and if it doesn't work that's fine but you won't lose anything by trying so that you just skirt that completely um so some some things which are helpful these are general solutions here uh to always view the sponsor and yourself as people who are innocent but are trapped in these patterns and so therefore not to take it personally so when i have played games with people it hasn't been personal to the person i've played it with i've been playing it my whole life with all sorts of different people same dynamic again and again and again so it's never personal if as a sponsor you're stuck 
what you can do, you can pray, you can call your own sponsor, read chapter seven of the big book, working with others. There are loads of great tips there. Sometimes you, you don't know how to handle a sponsor. You read that chapter immediately. You're like, you've forgotten some really basic things. And Al-Anon literature will sensitize you to all sorts of unhealthy patterns of yourself as a sponsor. Um, helpful ways of handling these situations in the moment. Don't take the bait. You know you're in a don't take the bait situation when you can smell the bait and it's just delicious. Uh, don't argue. Pause before speaking. Whilst you're pausing, pray. Uh, you can suggest reconvening later or the next day. Uh, come rediscuss the purpose of the sponsorship with the sponsee. Sometimes that slips and it needs to be brought back. You can gently come back to the topic at hand. So you that so when when you don't take the bait, you say you think to yourself, why are we here? What is this conversation supposed to be, be about? And you bring it back to that. Give them a task to do. That's what people did with me. Give them a task to do. Come back the next day. Everything's fine. Um, say one thing at a time and see how they respond rather than doing a kind of 10 minute spiel. Whatever you say, keep it simple. Um, Maybe don't explain anything, just present an offer. And if they don't want it, that's fine. And don't repeat yourself. If you're repeating yourself, as I've been told, you're nagging. And that solves most, that solves most situations. Um, if it's persistently difficult, I've learned to recognize much more quickly that I'm out of my depth. Have the grace to know when you're out of your depth, as a friend of mine says. Um, and a couple of final tips. Um, you can use humor with sponsees, but make sure it's good spirited and they're up for it. Not everyone is uh, has got a super well-developed sense of humor when they get sober. So you've got to test the waters gently with that one. Uh, try and encourage and give credit in the same breath as redirecting or setting boundaries. Don't answer the phone when you're angry. If your body starts to tense up during a call, don't pace around because that will make it worse. Sit down and if possible, lie on your back. It will change the timbre of your voice. It's very hard to shout when you're lying on your back. If you're leaking or if you're flawed, pause and say you'll call them back later. Pray for the right thing to say. And then only call back or provide input once your emotions are completely neutral and you're completely sure of the response. While you're still going back and forth, don't call. Wait till you're clear and comfortable with the response and then uh, give it a go. And if a response feels like punishment, it is. So, And you can always ask, does this feel like I'm punishing the person? If it does, you're punishing. However much you sugarcoat it, you're punishing. So stop. Um, hold it back there's always a better way but the one thing i'd say at the end of this we're not professionals we're amateurs if we get any of the above right like 57 percent of the time we are doing sensationally well and should get, get gold medals we're human beings as sponsors who are taking time out of our days to try and help people while we've got all of the other shit going on as i say we're not professionals we're also alcoholics <laughs> with our own you know issues so these as i say these are ideals that i haven't fully manifested uh sometimes i get them right sometimes i don't they're ideals to gradually inch towards and just the awareness of these itself can be super helpful in just changing the whole dynamic so you're not just running on automatic um that's all i've got alistair as far as presentation is concerned so we've got some time for questions if there are any Super, thank you very much, Tim. Um, <laughs> excellent, thank you. Um, yeah, at this point, I uh, can open it up for questions. Um, we've got a few more people than uh, last week, so probably if, if you do know how to raise your hand, that would be uh, helpful, and I'll try and get you in order. If you can't raise your hand through Zoom, if you do have a question, kind of wave at the camera, and I'll, I'll, I'll hopefully get to you if, uh, if you're having problems doing that. So, yeah. Open up for questions. Uh, my name is Karen. I'm an alcoholic. Uh, thank you, Tim and, and Alistair. Thank you for um, uh, 
presenting for us. Um, I don't have a question, but I, ha I don't have a question because Tim, I'm absorbing everything you were saying and still trying to take it in. And I so appreciate um, your, your labeling it. It puts humor to it. And, and yet your presentation was so enjoyable and, and so humorous at times, and yet very serious, serious things that we can get involved with, with, with sponsor sponsorship. And I'm, I'm just so grateful that I was able to be here to listen to this. Thank you so much. I'll jump in with one, if I may. Tim, um, had any experience of someone kind of um, agreeing with the principles of the program except one? So, for example, the, well, uh, explain the phenomenon of craving completely differently and saying, I just disagree with everything in the, on the physical craving in the main book. Uh, and how have you reacted to that? Um, that's, that's, a, that's, a very, that's a very good question. Um, I, I had this with with I, this actually this precise problem with someone a few years ago, and I spent months, months of my life <laughs> trying to put it across this person. And every time I thought it was there, it was basically like trying to make a a, a, a castle out of treacle. Um, you know, with the best will in the world, it just wasn't. It just wasn't happening. One one of the difficulties there is there are certain pivotal aspects of the program. So the basic notions of step one: physical craving, mental obsession. Uh, you've got this this uh, the notion of uh, uh, we had to let go of our old ideas. Absolutely, is an It's a fundamental notion. Uh, you've got. Uh, the first requirement is that any life run on self-will can hardly be a success. There are quite a lot of these, actually. And the thing is that the structure of the program will collapse if one of these is missing. It, that is my experience of it. I've, I, I had a very rickety program because of that for years. So I go back to the... Um, uh, what it says in Bill's story about the foundation of complete willingness, so complete honesty, open-mindedness and willingness. And what the honesty is, everything that I've done to date has failed. Therefore, everything must be questioned. And that's what opens my mind to something new and being willing to live as though something is true. Um, my job was to accept what was offered, not because I thought it was right or not so um wh when i'm at loggerheads with people i i've i stop i as soon as i realize it's happened i don't try and fight past it because i've never succeeded but often they go to someone else and they explain it just slightly differently and boom, it goes straight in so not everyone is meant to sponsor a particular a particular person sometimes there's just some reason why it's not working so i don't fight it i just suggest they go on to the next person um, hi, thanks so much for the meeting, uh, Tim and Alistair. Um, my question is, I'm working with people on step four and um, asking them to look at what's the new idea or the way that I put it is what's the truth of the situation. And I'm finding that some people, although they've been in the program many years, they have no uh, recovery so they have no spiritual principles so they can't see they can't they don't have anything to say there and you know and then I find it like I'm just feeding things to them and I'm wondering if you have any tips for that yeah they're just, just very briefly on that um, I think I, I get a lot more mileage in step four from uh, recognizing where my thinking is screwy uh, or my morality, where my values are flawed, because those are the visible things. And uh, honestly, I, I think Dan L says this, that this is all about subtraction, not addition. So if you said that uh, a Jim talks about it as well, that, you know, the, 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 I don't know if it's true or not, the apocryphal maybe story about Michelangelo's David, that uh, they said, well, how did you carve 
David. He said, well, I just took a big block of marble and chipped away anything that wasn't David, and I was left with David. And I think you're left, if you, if you chip away the BS, eventually you're left with the truth. And the truth is not very complicated. It's sort of everyone's okay, really. We've all got slightly funny thinking, and let's all be nice to each other. Ultimately, that, that's what you're left with once you get all the, the rubbish out of the way. So I, I focus on, on looking at getting rid of what's visible and then the truth i think reveals itself hi um thank you libby i'll call it um yeah thank you and thank you tim um i guess my question would be any useful tips for um shutting down a conversation that is is a vent um you know someone venting to me um I find it really hard to do that in a way that's assertive, but kind and loving at the same time. Um, yeah. It, well, it depends how aggressive they are. <laughs> Some people, I, I've had times where I've just, I've literally had to put the phone down because I, I, I can't, you try to push back and, and they, people get very angry with you. Um, what I've what what I've done uh, as I've told the truth, uh, I've said I'm finding this a bit difficult to listen to, and honestly, I got lost about thirty seconds in, and I'm not taking in anything that you're saying. So how about we have a conversation where we do your turn, my turn, and we'll gradually work through this. So let's start from the beginning. Who's involved? Let's look at the people, then look at what happened, and gradually break it down um uh or as i said earlier you you get people to just go to a meeting have a bath listen to the radio have some dinner you know play a computer just something to get a bit of distance and maybe come back later because this that we can't, i don't think we can work with this that's how, that's how i do it and that seems to that seems to work pretty well Okay, uh, thank you, Tim. I think that's, we'll, we'll wrap it up there if we, if we may. Um... Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.